Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. For connectors, cables, and more, call 920-435-2973 or visit pl-259.com. And by the ham station. Get your new radio or antenna by calling 800-729-4373 or go to hamstation.com. It's ham radio with Neil Rapp. Here we go. Welcome to Ham Talk Live. Call in. Let's talk. Neil's your guy. Ham Talk Live. Here we go on Ham Talk Radio. everyone this is ham talk live episode number 29 picking the best receiver to work with the expeditions rob sherwood nc0b recorded live on thursday september 1st 2016 i'm your host neil rapp wb9 vpg thanks for tuning in to this episode of ham talk live Tonight we'll be joined by the top authority on receiver performance, Rob Sherwood, NC0B from Sherwood Engineering. And Rob will talk about his rankings of all the major rigs and how to pick the best one for you. We'll talk about uh, that and your take your calls live in just a few minutes. Last week, Ward Silver N0AX was here to talk about the Yasme Foundation and his spurious emissions band. We even had a chance to listen to their cover song, cover of the NCJ that's still stuck in my head a week later. Uh, So if you missed the show, you can listen anytime at hamtalklive.com. You can also listen to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Get your questions ready to go for Rob Sherwood after the introduction. Uh, You can call us on Skype. That username is hamtalklive. Or you can call us by telephone. The number is 812-NET-HAM-1. You can also send your questions via Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at HamTalkLive. And we'll also keep an eye on the chat box here on the website as well. So I'll be back with Rob Sherwood, NC0B, right after this word from the ham station right here on ham talk live this episode of ham talk live is brought to you by the ham station for 35 years the ham station has brought new and used radios antennas accessories and equipment to the amateur radio community give jeff or dan a call at 1-800-729-4373 or order online at hamstation.com hamstation carries all the major brands like icom yezu and kenwood shop from a wide selection of radio scanners MFG accessories, Heil Sound products, Mirage and Ameritron amplifiers, Cushcraft antennas, and more. Easy online shopping and fast shipping are waiting for you at hamstation.com or call 1 800 729 4373. The Ham Station, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. A flashlight is a case for holding dead batteries. Now, here's Neil Rapp with more Ham Talk Live. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live. The ham station has you covered for both new and used equipment. Give Dan or Jeff a call at 800-729-4373 or go to hamstation.com. Be sure to listen to Ham Talk Live every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time right here at hamtalklive.com. And if you miss the show, you can download the podcast from the website and most popular podcasting websites. 
Rob Sherwood, MC0B, was first licensed in 1961 with a novice license, WN8ADB, at age 14, in Cincinnati, Ohio. He upgraded to general class about two months later, and his call sign changed to WA8ADB. He operated as Portable Zero in the mid-70s out of Colorado, and now lives there just east of Fort Collins. He upgraded to Advanced and Extra in the 80s, and obtained his current call sign, NC0B. In 1974, Rob founded Sherwood Engineering, offering Drake radio upgrades, which he still does today. He started testing transceivers in 1976, which now total over 100. That data is now available online at his website, SherwoodEngineering.com. Uh, you use the first part of Sherwood and the first part of engineering. So it's S H E R W E N G dot com. Uh, Sherwood Engineering now offers modifications to many shortwave receivers and is an authorized dealer of Japan radio receivers and still makes parts and upgrades for the Drake R4C, including roofing filters, crystals, capacitor replacement kits, and even owner's manuals. Rob! Welcome to Ham Talk Live. Well, thank you, Neil. Nice to be with you. Great to be with you uh, again. Uh, I get to see you at uh, Contest University uh, um, in the last couple of years anyway, and uh, get to hear all about this. So I thought we would uh, give it a, a chance for people to call in and ask some questions and uh, and hear a little bit about this in case they uh, they haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, one one, one yeah. note, as far as the website, you can also use nc0b.com. It goes the same ah, place and may be easier to remember. That would be a lot easier to remember. So nc0b.com uh, gets you to the same place. Very good. Well, in your uh, laboratory, you've made measurements of receivers over the years, and you maintain a ranking of uh, most of the popular rigs out there on your website. Uh, tell our listeners what this list should be used for and then also what it shouldn't be used for. Well, it lists many f parameters of receiver performance and you know, sensitivity, noise floor, which are similar, uh, dynamic range, which means receiving weak signals surrounded by strong signals and things like that. But what unfortunately happens is we become over uh, – uh, we pay too much attention to the, like the dynamic range number, which is how it is sorted you know, in, in that order. You have to sort a table in some order. So I've had people say, well, I've got a radio that rates 100, but there's a new radio that rates 102. Should I sell my 100? I make range radio and buy one's 102. Well, that's silliness, of course. So you have to be use some common sense. So you look at the big picture, you know, the numbers in performance for, like you said, a contest or a de-expedition or something when we've got hundreds, if not thousands of stations on to calling uh, a weak station out in the Pacific, for instance. The You want to have your receiver good enough to handle what, most of your operating is, and don't get get um, carried away with with a, a dB here or there, even 10 dB here or there. Look at the big picture. So these these rankings that you have, uh, while they do rank radios according to certain performance criteria, the differences in those levels are are pretty small. And most major uh, transceivers these days have great front ends anyway. Is that fair to say? Well, let's say um, I, when I started doing this, the numbers were much lower in the key figure for a contester or a DX pileup or something like that were much lower. And so a difference between a radio that was 70 dB – versus 80 was extremely significant and let alone a radio that maybe came out <laughs> 10 years ago that was 60 or 62 but now if 
radios in general have moved up. So if we've got a radio that's 90 versus 100 or 100 versus, let's say, approaching 110 or like 108, which is actually maybe the highest that I've measured, then they're all good. So then we have to say, well, what what do I – what modes do I operate? Do I work CW? Do I work sidemen? Uh, do I like a radio with knobs? Do I like to run it with a mouse? Uh, what's the reliability? How's the receive audio? How clean's the transmit audio? So we really need to weed out the disasters and then say, okay, here's my block of transceivers, and I'm going to look at all of these and then pick something that makes sense. And, of course, price. I mean, we've got radios now that are really good from – $1,500 to $15,000. Well, that's certainly a range that's uh, staggering. Although if you really go back in time and talk about the gold dust twins, which were Collins radios back in the 50s, they were by today's standards no more expensive than some of these astronomical prices. So it isn't like we've never heard of extremely expensive radios even in the 50s. But we have to we have to look at a broad spectrum of uh, issues, including price. Yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, these measurements and, and how you uh, go about obtaining them and, and maybe a little bit about what ones are kind of similar so that way we can kind of know what we're looking at on these tables. Okay, well, I've got my table up here on a, another computer. Well, if you go to my website and you go to the – click on the little banner goes across and it brings up the table and – We've got several parameters, and the one is the noise floor, which is similar to sensitivity. If the noise floor is good, the sensitivity is good. Well, everyone wants to have a radio that can receive weak signals, so that's a number that has significance. But we have to also realize that on most bands, particularly the lower bands, band noise is dominant over receiver noise. But like 10 meters, that's a different story. Uh, it's important to have very good sensitivity on 10 meters because the band noise is much less. So we we have to think about well, what bands are we operating. Also, the last six years on 10 meters has been phenomenal. And if you're a contester or just a rag chewer, uh, I put up a 10-meter tower and a 10-meter Yagi about six or seven years ago. Boy, I was just lucky I got it up in time. But now we're going down in the sunspot cycle. So the 10 meter performance relative to like what's going on in 40 meters will be less significant till the next round of sunspots. And, and while we're talking about this, we were just talking right before the show about the uh, FCC and how they have, uh, you know, established the noise floor. Um, and, and what have you seen out of the noise floor over the years? Well, what you're referring to is the FCC actually asked for documents from industry, from hams on what's happened to the general noise floor of the HF bands, particularly in an urban environment. And I'd say they've gone up about an S unit, about 6 dB every decade. So when I moved to the Denver area in uh, 1969, it was pretty quiet. But it is significantly noisy. And you say, well, plasma TVs, oh, switching power supplies. Computers, of course, have switching power supplies. Fluorescent lights, um, things like that. Uh, there are routers for your Internet. Everyone's got an Internet where your routers put out birdies and things like that. So the noise level is a significant problem today, particularly in the city. So this is uh, this is going to give you – a rating that's going to help you fight that a little bit. Well, if you're lucky enough to live in an urban environment, I mean, if you're lucky enough to live in a rural environment, then you've got a better shot at hearing weak signals on 10 meters, for instance. But if you're in the city, it's going to be more difficult. So the, the ranking of the sensitivity, I'll get a phone call and someone will say, I want to work more DX. What's the, what receiver should I purchase today? And so, unfortunately, if you're living in the city like I do part of the time, then that noise, urban noise level is, is maybe the most dominant thing that limits what you can do. But the other thing that's important is your antenna. And we want a good receiver, of course, but if you've got an antenna that's 
25 feet off the ground, then that's going to be a limit too. So as we chatted earlier, certainly your receiver is important, but your antenna is important. Your skill to work a de-expedition or to work a contest is important. So all these things have are part of the picture. Okay, and, and let's let's get back to the to the chart too, and and look at some of these other uh, measurements and how you take those. Okay, well, like if we're measuring noise floor or sensitivity, we have a calibrated signal generator, we have the receiver, and we feed it feed in a signal. So the we make that measurement, and then there's other measurements like blocking. So when the radio starts to compress, as far as it it's not linear anymore, we measure the front end to see, well, has it got enough selectivity to keep another station that's on another band that might be five miles away out of my radio? The filters, of course, are not have inf- do not have infinite rejection, so we, me- we measure that. And then, of course, what this table is sorted by in order of performance is one thing, close in dynamic range. And that, again, dynamic range means we're trying to weak, work that weak station and all sorts of strong stations are around it. Now, that ranking is a, more important for the CW operator than for sideband. And you say, well, why would that be? Well, on sideband, if there's a station three KCs away or five KCs away, He has transmitted splatter products, not because he's being a bad operator, but the amplifier in our radio that puts out 100 watts, let's say, has a certain level of distortion. So if that distortion products that spread out over several kilohertz, like as much as 10, are the dominant factor, well, then we might not be able to receive that weak signal because of a station three or five KCs away. But on CW... Signals are much narrower, or at least they should be if they don't have key clicks. So in that case, that's why I say this ranking was really oriented to CW DXing contesting, and that's when that number is most important. So if you got a phone call and and somebody said, hey, um, I want to pick out the best rig to work, let's say the um, Bouvet Island expedition coming up, um, what are your top two choices or top three choices? What are you going to tell them? All right. Well, I'm going to say don't consider the top two or three. Look at the chart and say, well, let's look at the top 10, maybe the top 15 or even 20. We have to say what's good enough most of the time. Now, you could always say I want the best one there is, but there's other aspects of radio performance and what's important to you depending on the modes and what Maybe how you're hearing is to me a really clean audio is important, but someone else they don't even notice distortion and things like that. So as I mentioned, back in the time when the classic radios went away, your Collins and your Drake, they had pre-selectors. The performance was in the 70 dB range approximately, and then the upconversion radios came along. Like the TR-7 was the first one. That's a Drake. But then your Kenwoods and your Yezus and all that, everybody went to a radio that didn't have mechanical things like pre-selectors. Of course, what was the most amazing pre-selector was the was the R-390A, the Collins R-390A and the spinoffs that were other OEMs. So that went away with the design change as Solid State came in. And so we couldn't have a mobile rig that you could hold in the palm of your hand with a pre-selector in it. But then we had radios were almost all the same for about 20 years, and they really were not adequate for CW contesting and de-expeditions. They barely worked for sideband in the crunch conditions, and that's when really my chart became significant in that in one case, I modified a Drake R4C, and that moved to the top of the chart, and then the Tentec Orion 1 came along, and that was the first solid state radio that outranked that modified Drake and pushed the dynamic range number up into the 90s. So really, if you've got a radio that's, I always have said, 80 to 85 is good enough most of the time, but you kind of want a little safety factor. So let's say we're going to say, I want a 90 dB radio. Well, then you've got a, a wide choice because they've gotten better and better every year 
or every, say, few years. And so there's a whole slew of radios that are going to fit that minimum requirement. And then we say, okay, that's we've got this list now. We're going to look at all those other aspects. Very good. So it's not just about the rig, folks. It's your antenna, your your skill, and what your preferences are and other things like, you know, how clean the audio is and the transmitter, all those kinds of things. So lots to consider, but if, if you're going after receiver performance, go over to nc0b.com and take a look at, uh, at Rob's numbers, and uh, he's got them all right so, there. So let me give you a number like you said to the top one or two. Well, look at the top one or two or two or three. We've got a flex radio, which, of course, is run with a mouse, although they now have a product that gives you knobs <laughs> that cost almost as much as a radio. And we have the K3S from Ellicraft out of California, and these numbers are over 100. So they're significantly above my minimum standard. I say, we really want an 85 dB radio. As a, as a round number, you say, well, what about 84, 83? Let's don't go nitpicking like that. But so we've got many choices from many different companies that are going to be 85 or better in that in that right-hand column that is how I sort my measurement test. But then look at the other things, too. Very good. Well, we have some questions uh, from some of our listeners, and uh, I'm sure we'll get some more. So we're going to be... Uh, Coming back here in just a minute and take your calls with Rob after we pay a few bills. Uh, so right now we have this message from Tower Electronics here on Ham Talk Live. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. Tower Electronics has been the Ham's dime store since 1978, bringing connectors, antennas, cables, and other parts to the world. Scott and Jill travel the country bringing their store to you at HamFest, but you can also order online at pl-259.com or by calling 920-435-2973. Stock up on those supplies like PL-259 and end connectors, audio cables, mobile antennas, and hamsticks. Their silver-plated end connectors are even in use on the International Space Station. Tower Electronics is a dealer for MFJ, Comet, Daiwa, OPEC, Workman, and HamPro Technologies. Tower Electronics, online at pl-259.com, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. A clean house is a sign of a broken radio. You're listening to Ham Talk Live with Neil Rapp. Join the conversation. Call us on voice with Skype at Ham Talk Live or give us a call at 812-NET-HAM-1. That's 812-638-4261. Now, here's more Ham Talk Live. We'd like to thank Scott and Jill at Tower Electronics for sponsoring the, the show tonight to help uh, bring Ham Talk live to you. Uh, they'll be at the Shelby, North Carolina Ham Fest this weekend and will be coming soon to Findlay, Ohio, Peoria, Illinois, and Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Call 920-435-2973 or visit their website at pl-259.com. Be sure to listen to Ham Talk Live every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time right here on HamTalkLive.com. Also, check out our Facebook page and our Twitter feed. Just search for Ham Talk Live. All right, it is now time for your calls. So if you have a question for Rob, now is the time to call. That number is 812-NET-HAM-1. 812-638-4261, or you can Skype your question at Ham Talk Live, or you can tweet am, at Ham Talk Live, or you can post it in the chat room. And we do have a couple of uh, tweets here, and we also have a call. So we'll take this uh, call right here. Hello, who's this? Hi, this is Marty, KC1CWF. Hi, it's Chicken with Fries. How you doing, Marty? Doing good. So what's I have a your, question. Yeah, what's your question? Yeah, typically I call when I have a question. 
Or yeah. I didn't come up with the excuse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious, Rob, what the uh, what is the radio that you currently use as your daily driver, day to day? If you just if if you were to walk into your shack right now, what is what is your primary radio? Well, I really have two, and one is the Kenwood TS nine ninety S, which is did, their big. Hang, hang on a second. Did you hear that, Marty? A Kenwood. Yes, he said a Kenwood nine ninety S. Yes, I heard that. Okay, I just want to make sure you heard. He said Kenwood nine ninety S. Okay, it's, Kenwood is the key. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> okay, so actually I have three operating positions in my shack. And the left position has an ICOM pure analog transceiver, the old ICOM 781 that had a, has a CRT in it. And it came out at least 25 years ago. And that's my reference analog radio because digital radios sometimes have funny artifacts. So if I hear something that sounds weird, and of course I've probably had virtually every modern radio through the shack at some point in time, and a lot of them in a contest. So if I hear something funny, I need to be able to go back to a reference radio and then switch back and forth. So I've got a classic analog, and then I have a fairly modern, a few years old Kenwood. I have an ICOM Pro 3, and I even have that little ICOM 7300 that just came out soon before the Dayton Hamvention. That's a direct sampling radio. So I use them all. As a matter of fact, I was on the air last weekend, and we were trying to figure out which band to be on for one of my normal schedules. Conditions are kind of crazy, and I change bands by changing chairs. <laughs> so I wouldn't say that I have – don't just say I've got that one Kenwood. I've got a Kenwood and ICOMs, and uh, and I've used the Flex and the Anna. And so uh, I've used – on a regular basis, I use several brands. Yeah, I think I think that's interesting. I think a lot of people would be kind of interested to see what you use, obviously, because you know that you know better than most. Um, I, I find I find it interesting how you kind of have like one from each of I guess what you could consider the three categories: an old old analog radio, a more modern radio with DSP, and then an SDR. It's very very cool how you kind of all all three categories, and I think Neil's quite excited that one of them is the uh, TS nine ninety. Well, one thing, you know, I've been testing in the laboratory since 1976, and then my first article was a looked at really dynamic range in radios that were having problems and how to how could I fix it, which in that case was the Drake R4C back in 1977 Ham Radio Magazine, a wonderful magazine. Unfortunately, we don't have anymore. It was much more technical oriented than current magazines, but the the laboratory obviously gives us numbers to get a good starting point. But then in the last nine years since I have my contest station out in the country, east of Fort Collins, Colorado, it's been fantastic to use these in CW contests and sideband contests and get to use the SDRs and the analog and the regular DSP radios and use a wide range and see how they really sound and are they easy to use and can – can I be efficient in a contest? So you really getting your hands on is important. Yeah, that's cool. I, I find it interesting that you contest, or I, I assume you, you, that you, you contest with the 7300 because it, you, when, we, when, I, when I would think about, maybe not, when I think about radios, I think of, you know, the 781 and the TS-990 is really, contest grade big uh, dual receiver radios and then the 7300 is more of an entry level radio do you think the performance is really getting there with the SDRs well with the the flex and the Anon, definitely and i've used those in c to be a contest uh, i haven't used the 7300 yet because you know it just came out and i got one just right. in time for contest university and also uh, the ICOM 7851 was on loan temporarily for a few weeks. But, of course, the contest season won't start again until October, at least in my case. I mean, there was a 1010 contest that some people think 1010 is a contest or not, but I like it. And I've won Colorado a few times. So, uh, But I haven't had a chance at all to put the 7300 in a contest environment yet. It's too soon, but I will this, this fall. Well, you know, thanks so much. I think you kind of answered all my questions. But uh, 
I'm intrigued to see how the 70s 300 performs at a contest and by not so much about the performance of the receiver, but how um, with the with the interface, it's such a it's such a small package. How how you can manipulate it for a contest, which will be interesting to see. Thanks so much well, for taking my call. Okay, very good. Well, it will be fascinating to use it. Now I'll m- mention that I've used the KX3 in two contests. Now that's a radio that's smaller than the that's a small radio, and, and I also. Thanks to Ellacraft, they loaned me a 70 uh, – I'm sorry, they loaned me a KX3, and I was on the air from Easter Island for three days. Not as a de-expedition. It was a trip with my wife, and I was on the air each morning and each afternoon, and that was just a kick. I was running 12 watts on a battery from Easter Island, so that was good too. Yeah, there, there must have been plenty, plenty of people wanting to talk to you there, right? All right, thank the small, you. It's, it's cool with the small radios there. Yes, yes. But you're right. You, thank need, you, thank you, need, you need good ergonomics. It need, you need to be – whatever radio it is, it needs to be easy to use and not a chore. Right. That, that's what I'm interested in with how the uh, – with the, how the ICOM came out with the 7300 with the touchscreen and everything. I, uh, I'm intrigued to see how uh, you, you think of it after using it in a contest. Uh, contest I'm interested and I wonder how it will compare to when I know Icon just uh, in uh, they just released uh, they just, they just announced the uh, what was it the seventy six ten how that, that how that will uh, how that will uh, play in a contest environment. Thanks so much for taking that call. Sure. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate the call. Bye bye. Bye bye. So mentioning the seventy six ten, what we don't really know is it a spin off. Of the 7300, which I hope it is, or is it a Mark II version of the 7600, which is a standard up conversion radio with DSP? They didn't say. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, and and you know obviously I'm I'm giving Marty a hard time about the the Kenwood 990 because that's the one that I keep drooling over, but. Um, but while we're talking about ICOM and, and the and the 7300, I know um, that there were a lot of people that were really surprised when the 7300 came out and they went to your charts to look and see where it was, and it shot right up into the top 10 uh, up against a lot of these other radios. So why why don't you just briefly talk about overall impressions of the of the 7300 so far? Okay, and it's one thing we need to discuss is testing of direct sampling radios is not straightforward like our radios we've had now forever. Whether it was a, a an old Drake or a Collins or a, a TS590, which is a now a thirteen hundred dollar radio, they don't act the same way. So a DS, a direct sampling radio, the distortion products are somewhat constant, where an all our legacy radios, you feed in a signal and you keep increasing the test signal levels and eventually the distortion products start appearing above the noise floor of the radio. And then you drive it harder and the, the distortion products just go up about a 3 to 1 rate. That's not the case with these direct sampling radios at all. So it's hard to compare and because the direct sampling will have – Modest distortion all the time, and if it's covered up with band noise, we don't care. But it sort of has a brick wall that at some point, boom, it goes into horrendous overload. So it's just totally different. Very good. Well, I'm, you know, uh, the front end overload I know is is has been a bit of an issue uh, on it, and I. I'd like to try one out. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll try one, but it sure has taken the uh, ham radio world by storm. That's for sure. And uh, a lot of cool features that you wouldn't normally see at that price level for sure. Right. And let me make some more comments about the details. You mentioned the testing was interesting at that. It has a feature called IP plus, which is a, or a consumer term for something called dither, which sounds like nonsense. But it did two things. It it raised the noise floor, which meant it was less sensitive, and it raised it a lot, 
more than 10 dB. So in 80 meters, you wouldn't care, but in 10 meters, you would. So I never run it. And it, it also was one of those strange things where because the noise in its dither, which really shouldn't be there, covered up the lower level distortion products that made the number kind of inflated. So if you read the footnote, you really should read the footnotes on my website. And I'm suggesting don't run it unless you have a real need for it. It does not make it that crash point where the radio just goes nuts with, as with any direct sampling radio. It doesn't change that in the slightest. It just affects the lower level measurements. The other thing is probably not the perfect radio for field day unless you've got band filters because it's got a really wide front end. I mean, it's an entry-level radio. It's small. It's fun to use. I like it. I own one. But the if you're on 20 meters and you had another station on field day on 40 meters and, let's say, another station on 17 meters, that front end only knocks those two other bands down 10 dB. That's not much. So if you're running a, a multi-field day station, you better have band filters, band pass filters for each band. And if you're running a CW station and a sideband station on the same band, well, then, of course, the band pass filter wouldn't help at all. So you just have to realize what its limitations are and what its strengths are. But it is very easy to use. The touchscreen works very simply. It's not a hindrance, and it keeps you from having to dig into all sorts of menus most of the time. All right. Well, let's uh, take some of these questions here from Twitter. We've got uh, several of them uh, racked up. Uh, the first one says, uh, what do you think about the new SDR radios versus a Drake R4C with all the upgrades you can get? <laughs> all right. And I didn't send that question in. Well, I actually did contest just a few years ago with a modified C line with my mods in it and a 10 tech Orion 2 with the Eagle upgrade, and I actually used the Eagle upgrade sub receiver because I was checking that out for Jack Birchfield. So they both perform well. But in this day and age, if you're a contester, you got to have computer logging. That's a weak point for anything like a Collins or a Drake or a Hammerland or any of the old radios. They don't talk to your computer. Now, if you're running a single band contest like I was on 160, I just had to give up the fact my log had no idea what frequency I was transmitting on. If you look at the chart on a modified C line, you'll see it it fits that criteria of it's about 85 dB. I think it's 84, but it's it's it makes the cut. But then there's other radios that one thing that was a shock when the FTD FT2000 came out, it's not that long ago, maybe approaching 10 years, maybe not quite that long, and its numbers were like in the 60s, whether you looked at the ARRL test or my test or anyone else. And so that was a case where you, you, see, you found it way down on the chart. So, again, look at the look at the chart and say, okay, I'm going to sort of make a cutoff and, you know, 85 plus. And um, so the C line was there and your TS-590 is there. A, a lot of radios are uh, – Vastly different prices. The Hilberlings there for eighteen thousand dollars. The uh, seventy-eight fifty-one at one hundred and five. But again, it's like thirteen thousand dollars. But you've also got, you know, a KX three for what is it, a thousand dollars. So um, a lot of options. Very good. And uh, a couple. Uh, then thanks to uh, Brian KC nine KUH uh, for sending uh, in that question. By the way, and uh, Dr. Scott Wright K zero MD says if someone with a superb antenna system who's operating largely DX contesting, what two performance criteria are most important? Well, if it's CW, the close in diamic ranges, because that D expedition, you're going to have thousands of stations that are up two, up three, up four, that are going to be calling, and you're going to be hearing a lot of those, and they're going to potentially intermod on top of the DX station. And of course, we're all go, so going to have some lids that are going to be calling on frequency. Not much you can do about that. So for the CW, either a contest or a D expedition, 
look at the close-in dynamic range, which is what the table is sorted by, and that's why I did it that way. And that's really the, the big number. Almost every radio made is sensitive enough, so that's not a limit. And unfortunately, if you're in the city, you're probably not going to ever be able to realize that sensitivity that's there. And again, that sensitivity is really important on 10 meters, 12 meters, 15 meters. It's almost meaningless on 40 meters during the nighttime. But then don't forget, it depends on time of day and you've got you've got good antennas. I ran into a case with one OEM that the radio didn't have a preamp on 80 meters, for instance. And during the daytime, I was listening at 8.30 in the morning and I couldn't copy this one station on the modern radio, but it could copy it on my 25-year-old ICOM. So we do need sensitivity, even on the low bands, particularly at daytime. And also, amazingly, when I work 160 contests, and I'm working JAs from Japan about 7 o'clock in the morning, well, the, the sun's coming up, but the band is really quiet. So it's amazing that in here, here you're on the lowest ham band that we have. Well, there are some below the broadcast band, but they're kind of experimental. That we do have to be concerned about um, sensitivity. So it, it, I guess if you say which two, dynamic range at the right column, sensitivity the left column. But keep your preamp off unless you need it. I have a friend who has the 7300. I was talking to him on 40 meters. And he had the preamp on, and he was complaining about some some overload. You don't need a preamp on the 7300 on almost any band except maybe 10 and 12. Certainly not 40 meters, and keep it off. So if you want to minimize the radio's chance of overload, only use a preamp when you need it. All right, we've got one minute left, and I've got one more question here. Uh, what do you see the OEMs doing with SDR? ICOM seems to be going to SDR. What do you think Yezu and Kenwood are going to do? Are they going to stay super heterodyne or follow suit? And then what are the advantages for the super heterodyne? Well, if you look at the top two, you've got you've got the Flex and you've got the KS3, and they really measure very similarly. So they're both good. So I just say don't don't pick a radio on architecture. Pick it on what makes what makes sense for you. But the the uh, ICOM really shocked the world with the 7300. I mean, they've sold thousands of them. It's hard to get on the air and not hear somebody talk on a 7300. So I think that ICOM will be going in that direction. Uh, the 7851 may be the last really big analog uh, front end type of radio, super heterodyne, let's use that term, that uh, comes out of the big three out of, out of Japan. I would expect the Yezu and Kenwood to be looking at it seriously. But we'll just see what what the sales figures are over time. You know, if the 7610 is a big brother for a 7300, it might be a monster seller like the 7300 has. And it'll probably be a three or four thousand dollar radio. So the, the the question now everyone's asking, well, what is Elecraft going to do? Is there ever going to be a K4? Will the K4 be a super hat radio because the K3S is a really good radio and maybe they'd make it bigger with the band scope built in and maybe a power supply built in, built in and all that kind of stuff. But that's the big unknown. But there's nothing wrong with either one. They both work and really look at look at price, features, um, size, do you need a computer to run it, all that kind of stuff before you look at the architecture. Very good, Rob. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That is a wrap for this week's edition of Ham Talk Live. I'd like to thank my guest, Rob Sherwood, NC0B of Sherwood Engineering and everyone out there in cyberspace for listening and calling in. I invite you back next Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And our plan is for Skylar Fennell, w, or a KD0WHB, the Bill Pasternak Young Ham of the Year Award winner to be with us. He's still working on his... Uh, schedule so hopefully that will be our guest uh next week for a list of all of our upcoming guests visit hamtalklive.com so for now this is neil rapp wb9 vpg saying 7375 and may the good dx be yours 